I started making work seriously as a performance artist in the mid-1990s and whereas not many years separate us in age, many years separate us in terms of practice. I started making work as an artist with some performance and installation stuff uh, in the late 70s. When I went to art school I had a grant. I had a grant for my MA. Um, and I could do anything I wanted. And people weren't really very concerned what that was. There was much less of the sort of assessment thing. Yeah. Um, so I think that really shifted. And then there was this desire to educate a larger and larger proportion of the population um, in universities, which I obviously think is a great plan, but then there wasn't the money to do it. So we get to the situation you've got now where the government is trying to get more and more people into higher education, but isn't prepared to fund it properly. And I think that is really difficult. So now, in fact, art schools are shrinking. And I've been a victim of that because I had a very nice job, which is gone. Um, so I now have to think of myself again in terms of my art practice rather than being situated somewhere between a, an academic and an art context, uh, which is interesting. I mean, it's fine. It's probably a, a good time for me because it means I can get on with what I would like to be doing um, in a different way. But it, it is part of a wider context, which I think is slightly troubling in that there aren't jobs around. I mean, I think... For myself, I stopped teaching in 2007 and I made a conscious decision to leave a lectureship that I'd been doing for about five years. And it felt a bit like jumping throwing myself off a cliff, really. I was quite terrified about how I was going to continue and uh, make my way. As an artist who doesn't sell anything, I've got no mm -hmm. commodity. The only thing I've got to sell is my horse on a plane seat or a train seat, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and really, that's all, I, that's all I've got to make money with. And uh, so there's been ups and downs and I managed to just about keep going, but I don't have gallery representation um, and I do it all myself. I make my own work and it tends to be very lo-fi and very easily made and sometimes made right on spot just before it's supposed to be presented. And so I find all these ways of working which are very media and realistically give me a chance of being able to keep going. And that seems to be like the, the only thing I'm really interested in doing. As long as I'm still making work, I'm fine. You know. Um, I think there's something interesting that, uh, for me, that came out of uh, going to see Documenta this year. This idea of precari, and it's it's used yeah. in Italian um, as a kind of precarious state. Um, it's applied to workers, cultural workers like us, um, but without any definable or constant sense of income. So it's, it's this notion of something being slightly precarious. But it's also used by Judith Butler um, in a slightly, dif slightly different context, which is about the kind of precariousness of the body and yeah. ideas of grievability, mourning. Um, and I think it's a really interesting one, and I suddenly found myself apply well applying yeah. it to me, this kind of very delicate balancing act of yeah. how you actually get on with the next thing. When I first, one of the first times I encountered you uh, was at a, a, a film screening at Tate, Tate Modern, as it was. And I remember it being a very structuralist series of films that were taking place over a whole entire day. And it was a very demanding thing to watch. So all of these things were all about like, squiggles and dots and mm. very formal structuralist work. And I do believe, if I'm, not, if I'm not wrong, I think you and I were the last two people sitting there at the end of it. <laughs> and um, I was very taken with your commitment to that form of art, of uh, very 
structuralist, um, quite demanding work, really. I mean, I know you have this identity politics on top of that. I wanted to be able to say things that you couldn't describe in those formal terms. And also as a right. committed feminist, I needed to work with certain kinds of yeah. narrative, which I think is, relates very much yeah. to the way you work. Yeah. Well, then, well, women Kate started coming in and making work on their own terms as well as being able to um, assimilate that, those sort of formal ideas. I mean, was it difficult? Did you get a lot of resistance from the men? Did there was women coming in at the time? Actually, there was quite a lot of difficulty from some of the women because mm -hmm. there were ideas that pointing a camera at a woman was equivalent to a terrorist act. So I had a big problem with the notion of silencing um, because representation was a really, really hot issue. So for example, when Carolee Schneeman's film Fuses was shown by the Royal College of Art yeah, Film yeah, Society, yeah. most of the women were up in arms. My own political background, my own identity politics is disability, as you know. It's not as politicised now as it was when I first encountered it. Mm. There was an eye water mock in the early 1990s when we were protesting against the telephone. Where has the disability movement expanded in terms of numbers? It's now become this really chintzy kind of culture of celebration. Everybody's having a great time, you know, climbing up poles and stumps out, you know, everybody's having a fantastic time, you know. And uh, the po politics of it is really been greatly reduced, le much less emphasis on it. I think the edginess of the politics has gone out of a lot of aspects of art practice. Well, um, yeah, I mean, as recently as the mid mid, uh, late 1980s, they used to do a lot of performances alongside Bob Covey, for example. Yeah. And there's a man who clear with him. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic, but it was so... So it was on this principle of everything being at stake and what we were doing and the people that we worked with. And it was just so impassioned in terms of it had to absolutely be like this and it can't happen any other way. And there was no, um, no, there was no slack or no compromise at all, exactly, yeah. I think it gets back to that earlier conversation about sitting in the structuralist filmmakers programme. Um, I used to go to the film co-op and sit and watch hours and hours of uh, Paul Charrette's flickering light or whatever. Um, and I think there's also something very interesting about that, which is within a kind of tradition of John Cage, where if something's boring for one minute, you do it for two, and if it's boring mm -hmm. for two, you do it for four, and so on, until you find a place mm -hmm. that you can start thinking in a bit more mm -hmm. of a contemplative way make something out of the world rather than just having to have boof, boof, yeah. boof, 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 boof satisfaction. I mean, <clears throat> a lot of the really factual art that we both enjoyed took place against the backdrop of factualism, obviously. So, um, those, those were horrible years, weren't they? It was very difficult, yeah. yeah. I remember um, being uh, on Arts Council panels in the in the early 1990s, I used to go and see it. I never used to get, get any money. I didn't even know there was an old council, and they wrote to me one day to so sit on the panel. And so I went down there and I said, yeah, OK. <laughs> I think I was quote, I was one of the first recipients of quota-based representation. You know, oh, this guy's deaf. You know. So uh, there I was, sat on the panel. And um, what was uh, interesting from the Tories' uh, perspective was that they um, clandestinely very much supported really bonkers left field all oh, because they saw it as if they gave public funding to that, to um, insurrectionary and radical forms of all, then they felt that that would trickle up to inform much more innovative forms of opera or um, mm. ballet and so on and so Especially forth. in a way you can see yeah, that, so, it's not that So, so look, yeah, we used to see the Avant Gold as being a very good seeding ground for ideas to trickle up to the opera world. But New Labour's whole idea was like inclusivity. Yeah, let's see, let's see black people, marginalised people, disabled people, all these. Let's just show them all having a really great time together, you know.
Yeah, and it seemed to be much less ideas driven and also very much more to do with how many people you could include rather than including different very specific interest groups. Um, so it was about bums on seats and that sort of thing rather than getting back to your kind of model of um, the gauge nut, the person who, the nerd, the the absolute expert who's going into some very esoteric area of the subject uh, with great intensity that probably excludes a large number of other people. Yes. And about representation as well. Mm. I mean, obviously, I'm in favour of, of um, all so-called minority identity groups being more included in society uh, thing. But with, um, with, the, with what happened in the old funding system in the 1990s is that it went to a lot of, a lot of the funding went into bringing that about without necessarily having an artistic movement alongside it. Yeah, it wasn't conceptually driven in the same way. It was much more about trying to bring more and more people in, which is great if you've got the two things going on, but if you're just trying to yeah. get more and more people in for the same amount of money, it's not really going to work. It's a parallel thing that happens within the education system. You want more for less. I think it's quite interesting at the moment that um, art has become popular entertainment in a way that it never was 20, 30 years ago. I mean, Everybody in London has heard of the Tate Modern. Most people have been to see something that is an art event. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's no longer outrageous um, waste of taxpayers' money. We like art as a country in a very, very different way. Yeah, I mean, art's never been so popular as it is, but it's also been, never been so uh, less credited for what it does, have they? Um, completely taken for granted by the powers that be. And, um, have the argument in favour of cultural support and um, what the public get out of art is uh, have exploded really in my, in my, during my time of making art. It's just that what you worry about is like, <coughs> it, whereas it's very, uh, it's very admirable that so many people are engaging with art and going to cultural palaces to see it, you just wonder whether they, um, I mean, people used to go and see or an experience or also add a very particular perspective and involvement with it themselves. Mm -hmm. They usually were artists themselves or had some powerful objective that they wanted to go and engage with before. And uh, what, what I think is that where we've got the numbers now, we don't have the um, commitment from 